Um, litigation funding hopefully isn't something which is new to you, but it's uh, an ever-developing area. Quite a lot's happened in the last year or so, so it seemed like a good, good opportunity to summarise where we've got to, throw out some of the issues which have come out from us talking with our own clients about it, some of the issues which they, they face, the questions they have about it, um, you know, some, some of whom are in the room, so I'm unashamedly borrowed some of the questions they've come to us with because they'll be, be of interest to everyone. Um, then talk through a few of the questions which your external lawyer should have. Um, so what they should be looking for, what they should be asking for, part of our experience. Um, this, this first slide is uh, well, effectively summarising our credentials. Um, why we're qualified to talk about it. We've been doing it for a long time. Um, started off just a case of CFAs. Um, it's now a lot more than that. It's CFAs, it's third party funding, it's after the event insurance, it's DBAs. Um, it's worth making the point that you know, there's, there's still two well-known law firms within 200 metres of us right now, I won't say who, who don't regularly engage on CFAs, let alone third party funding. Yeah, almost no one does DBAs. We're, we're doing one, not as an experiment, but to get the experience of it. Um, so it's still, it's still something that's moving, it's still something that's developing, and it's still something which isn't widely adopted, although we're seeing increasing demand for it, as Calista says, from our clients. Um, hopefully you know what all these things are. Um, if you don't know what they are, come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, we've got a brochure that sets them all out. Um, I'm, not, I'm going to assume a basic level of knowledge about CFAs, ATE, third-party funding, DBAs. Why are we talking about it now? Well, we've had the Jackson reforms in April last year. Um, they're now bedded in. Uh, we're seeing an increasing use both of ATE, after the event insurance, and third party funding. Uh, it's not just a case of people who can't pay for litigation anymore, it's people who uh, don't want to pay for litigation, people who have cash flow issues. It's a very different conversation with the FD, um, particularly if you're a large PLC and you go to them and say, we've got a big piece of litigation, it's likely to generate a significant windfall, but it's going to cost us five million to pursue this. You know, if you don't have a litigation budget, it's one thing going to them saying, we'd like, we'd like five million. It's another thing going to them saying, um, the case will cost five million. Now, we can either take this out of the regular business, borrow it from somewhere, or we can approach third party funders, law firms, try and find alternative ways of funding this, ways of offsetting our risk, ways of helping with our cash flow. Um, so it's a different conversation and it's one which our clients are increasingly asking us to explain to them so that they can then in turn pass that on internally. And it makes for a different way of looking at litigation spend. Uh, there's more participants in the market. Uh, in the last month or so, we've had IMF Bentham, who've been, who were one of the earliest litigation funders in Australia, huge business into the European market. Uh, there's a company called Bridgepoint, who are coming in from Canada, where DBAs and contingency fee arrangements are mainstream and have been for some while. They've just come in over here, so there's increased capacity, there's new ideas, there's more options, there's more funding products out there. Um, the, funding, the wordings of funding agreements are changing. Um, ATE is no longer just adverse cost insurance. Uh, you've got own side costs, human risk, arbitration default, cost undertakings for damages. The list goes on. There's all sorts of funky things you can do with it. Uh, I use that in the loose sense. Um, some of the questions which have come up from, uh, from our clients, um, and you know, these come to us from, you know, a lot of these come to us from one client in particular, but they're replicated by lots of other clients we talk to. So I thought it's worth just running through them to to an outlet for general interest. Um, I've talked about how funding cases can help manage litigation spend. How do you know if a case is suitable for funding? Well, um, it's not an exact science, but there's some ballpark figures. Most funders talk about a golden ratio of 10 times damages to costs. Uh, they want 60% plus prospects from counsel. Um, they want no enforcement risk over the judgment so that they know if you win, you can get the money back. Uh, who pays for the initial advice on the claim, something which is often overlooked. So you need to get that advice from counsel. You need to have your lawyers look at the claim, work out whether it's a good claim or not. Um, this is all before you've got funding in place. A funder might reimburse you retrospectively, uh, but you as a business may want to take the view that, OK, we'll, we'll pay for that initial upfront advice on the basis that we think this is something which we could get funding for um, and accept that if we don't, then... Uh, we, we, we suffer that cost or we talk to the law firm and you know, there are cases where we can come to arrangements where we take some of that risk as well. Um, it's an open question, but something that's worth thinking about at the outset. Um, how much will the funder want in return? Well, people talk about a three times multiple, so they want their money back and they want three times on top if they win. Um, that sounds like a lot, uh, but they're putting all their money at risk. And in the modern world, you rarely pay three times. It's not that simple. You have tiered tiered arrangements, you have discounts for early settlement, um, but in an overall picture, how much might you give away? That's a good starting point. 
um, when you approach funders, well, yeah, you, ne you need that council's opinion. You need to have done the initial work. There's no point going to them before that. Um, do your lawyers understand funding? Um, we've been doing it for a long time. We've got good relationships with funders. That has real practical benefits. Um, firstly, it means we know how to negotiate funding agreements. There's no such thing as a standard industry form. Um, typical things we look at, you know, who are the parties? Sometimes they include lawyers, sometimes they don't. Um, what's the order of priority for repayment? That's particularly important where you've got a funder, an ATE provider, um, you've got lawyers working on a CFA, all of whom have interest in the proceeds, not, not least yourselves as well. That needs to be structured and how it's structured varies a lot between funders. Um, you want someone that actually has experience of doing it so they understand what's, what they can push for, what they can't push for, um, what termination rights the lawyers and the clients have, who's going to pay for the ATE if you want ATE to cover you from adverse costs. Um, what ha happens to the funder's entitlement to a success fee if the case is overturned on appeal? Um, there are at least two funders in the loosely termed Association of Litigation Funders who hold themselves out as, a, as an industry body. It's, it's a loose association, but there's at least two funders in there who have said to us uh, their starting point is that if you win at first instance, they get their success fee. Fair enough. If the case is then overturned on appeal, you have to pay back that success fee. But at this stage, you've already had to pay back your damages to the other side. So you're now in the situation where you've taken out funding to manage your own risk. Uh, you've won the case. You've then had that decision reversed. And as a result of that decision being reversed, you've ended up actually in a worse position than you would have been if you'd funded it yourself from the start because you had to pay back the damages and you've had to pay back the fund of their success fee. So you end up significantly in the red. Um, yeah, I think that's scandalous, but there's at least two large funders out there that have that as their starting point for negotiation. Um, there's all sorts of bits like that, so that's why you need lawyers who understand funding and have worked with funders. Um, which funders should you approach? Well, there's lots of cowboys out there. There's lots of people that claim to be funders but are really brokers. Um, how secure are the funds? Ideally, you'd like everything on a UK-based escrow account. Rarely happens. Most funders are based offshore for tax reasons. That helps them raising capital, raising investment. Um, but there's various things you can do around that. Uh, will spending someone else's money impact on your continu continuous review of prospects and cost management? Might you become less engaged? Um, that was a point which I, yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but was raised by you know, one of our clients here. Um, and it's a, yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point to think about if you're in-house. Um, will, will you become disengaged with the case if you're not holding the purse strings on it? Um, the last one on that slide, what, was, what does it mean if you're faced with a claim from a funding par funded party? So... Typically, funding is used by claimants um, who are bringing claims. Technically, it can apply to defendants, but it rarely does. Um, I've spoken to quite a few of our banking clients who are typically defendants to actions, but more and more see clients bringing claims against them, sorry, not clients bringing claims against them, uh, customers bringing claims against them with the benefit of ATE or third-party funding or laws and a CFA, and it comes to a mediation, it comes to a settlement negotiation. Um, and they want to know, well, how does this impact them? If the other side has ATE insurance, it means they have to pay an additional chunk of money away on a settlement, so that impacts their ability to settle. You want to understand when that premium is payable, how much it's likely to be, who's actually holding the purse strings when it comes to settlement, who's going to make the ultimate decision, are all the stakeholders there, what does this mean? Um, so even if you're not going to use it yourself, um, everyone needs to know about funding now, it's there, it's there to stay, it's becoming increasingly common. Uh, the last couple of slides are concerns which come up for the external lawyers. So these are things which you know, we're very mindful of, um, things which come up with us regularly when people come and talk to us about funding. Um, protecting confidentiality, privilege. Um, how's privilege protected with a third party funder and AT insurers? Um, you need NDAs in place. Uh, sometimes you might want to set up a trust structure to add an extra layer of protection to that. Um, the covenant strength of the funder, um, if we're contracting with the client and there's also a funder involved funding this, um, got the nod, uh, <laughs> funders involved funding this, um, we're taking a risk on the funder as well. Uh, how, how involved is the funder going to be in running the case? Uh, some funders are very legally minded, some funders are financial people. Uh, if they don't have experience of cases of this type, um, then they won't necessarily understand the risk profile of the case, understand the drivers. Um, you don't want someone that's going to to um, skip out halfway through because they get cold feet. Uh, I'm going to skip through these very quickly. Uh, what due diligence does the funder need? If you know funders already, then you know we have funders who take a, a sort of fast track approach to that with us because they've worked with us before. Um, but otherwise, you need to get everything in place. 
Um, how did the fund structure it success fee? Is it cost they've spent up to that point, which obviously is a lot cheaper if you settle earlier? Or is it the cost of the whole case? So do they want their full whack anyway? Um, what happens if the case, quantum of the case changes for unforeseen reasons? The case overruns in budget. Is the funder going to be good for the money? Are they going to step in and back you? Um, and you know, can you structure the agreement in a way that actually allows settlement, bearing that in mind from the start and bearing that in mind when negotiating the agreement? So it's a big topic. There's lots to cover. I'd probably overrun. Um, but uh, do come and talk to us after if you've got any questions. There's lots of literature. We call it control, but um, happy to answer questions online. Thank you.